today, so I want to go ahead and get started. My name is Sandy Hagman. Um, I am part of the Senate uh, Committee on Hunger. I'm based here in Blacksburg, Virginia. And I'd like to welcome everybody to our monthly Food and Faith series <clears throat> that we are developing for creating and sustaining feeding programs in communities. This is the third of five planned presentations of this particular series. So we would invite you to come back again for the next couple of months and we'll have a wrap up in May. Uh, before we begin today's program, um, I would like to ask Pastor Kelly Bayer Derrick to lead us in a word of prayer. Thank you, Sandy. Yeah, for those of you um, whom I've never met, Sandy said I'm Pastor Kelly Bayer Derrick. I serve as an assistant to the bishop um, and get to have the great privilege of working with the Synod's Hunger Team as well as many of our other justice ministries. So thank you for being here. Um, our, my prayer this morning, this afternoon, I guess it is now, is a prayer attributed to Mother Teresa of Calcutta, who I suppose is now Saint Teresa of Calcutta. Um, so let us pray. Make us worthy, holy God, to serve our fellow human beings throughout the world who live and die in poverty and in hunger. Give them through our hands this day their daily bread. And by our understanding, love, give peace and joy. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Kelly. <clears throat> Today's program is a discussion by three people working in the area of hunger security. And I'm going to introduce them uh, in alphabetical order. So. Um, here we go. First is uh, Gary Lautenschlager. Hope I got that right, Gary. Very good. <laughs> All right. As a lifelong Virginia Lutheran, Gary has spent over 40 years putting his faith in action. He spent most of his adult life helping those in need, marginalized, and those forgotten by society. He's always been an advocate for the homeless, the hungry, and for children. Through his volunteer leadership with the Salem Area Ecumenical Ministries, he's been instrumental in creating ministries to help support feeding programs for students facing food insecurity in Salem and Western Roanoke College. Each week, over 140 students receive weekend breakfasts and lunch items, and during the summer months, over 14,000 meals have been provided to local disadvantaged families. In addition, Gary applied for a grant to establish student-led food pantries in the local and middle high school serving about 45 students each week. He's been responsible for raising $280,000 in the past five years to support other missions and ministries and is a very successful grant writer and fundraiser and has created partnerships with local congregations, businesses, community groups, vendors, and regional and state foundations. So welcome, Gary, and we'll look forward to hearing you speak. Thank you, Sandy. Next up is um, Ms. Monique Raposa. And Ms. Raposa had received a mechanical engineering degree from the University of Massachusetts, North Dartmouth in 1983 and worked in manufacturing for many years. Her experience includes process improvements and process flows and creating policies and procedures. Um, while working, she supported children's schools through PTA and her daughter's high school band experience. She gained her food handling experience by being a hospitality manager. This required that she budget, order food, and feed students and parents during band camp and band competitions. But in addition, she organized a moneymaker that was selling luncheons to visiting bands and during these competitions. So she ended up feeding over five bands and 140 students during each day during these competitions. So she put all of that to work so that when she retired after volunteering at her local food pantry, she decided that she, she had the opportunity to become the executive director of the Bread for Life food pantry and when its previous director retired. So she brings a lot of processing experience and we look forward to hearing about that as well. So welcome. 
Monique. And finally, um, I would like to introduce to you Pastor John Wirtz. Pastor Wirtz currently serves as a director for Evangelical Mission for the Virginia Synod and is one of the assistants to the bishop. Prior to joining the Virginia Synod staff, Pastor John was the pastor at St. Michael's Lutheran Church here in Blacksburg, and he helped launch Micah's Caring an Initiative. It's a community-based ministry that includes multiple things, including a backpack feeding ministry, a senior feeding ministry, a community garden, and a summer feeding ministry. Michael's Caring Initiative drew the majority of its financial and volunteer support from community members, local congregations, and grants. So welcome, Pastor John, and um, welcome to everyone who has joined us today. And we're going to start with Gary. All right, thank you so much. Uh, Lene, if you want to um, pull up the slides, I'd appreciate it. Uh, just simply a quick review of uh, what Sandy has talked about. Salem Mary Ecumenical Ministries is comprised of lay and pastoral representatives from churches and community organizations in the city of Salem in Western Roanoke County. Uh, you can see that we have um, uh, several different ministries. Uh, we have our Backpacks for Children, which is a weekend backpack program. Our Summer Feed and Read. Uh, obviously, this is a critical period for school children because they're not receiving uh, breakfast and lunch through the school program. We also sponsor a clothing closet. Uh, as Sandy indicated, we do um, have food pantries at the local middle school and high school. And we also provide books, personal hygiene packets and school supplies to our local schools. Um, if you wanna go ahead into the next slide. Uh, as we're all familiar with Martin Luther, uh, he says, God does not need your good works, but certainly your neighbor does. Uh, as well, our, one of our most basic and cherished commands is to love your neighbor as yourself. Um, and when we start talking about getting involved in some type of feeding ministry or feeding program, um, first of all, you want to identify the need. Uh, evaluate current resources evaluate community funding sources. Uh, also, um, look at to see what is also being provided. Uh, one of the things that we did before we started is we asked Pastor Wirtz to come down and talk about Micah's backpack program and how we could model our program after his. So there are a lot of resources available uh, that you can certainly tap into. When you evaluate those community resources and community funding sources, obviously look at local churches, your school divisions, community groups, your rotaries, your quantas, uh, what is United Way providing? Uh, do you have a local food bank that you can count on? Uh, as well, you can also get information from your local government planning departments and Chamber of Commerce uh, to see what is available, what's being done, uh, potential uh, resources and funding sources. Uh, when we first established, we looked at the demographics. Uh, we had to decide, was there a need within our community? So we looked at the percentage of families that were currently below the poverty level. And we also looked at the students who were eligible for free reduced breakfast and lunch through the federal program. Uh, we did have two elementary schools within our territory that were at least 50% uh, student eligible. Uh, so again, that was the criteria that we used as we continued to establish feeding programs within the schools. Another opportunity, another good resource is uh, looking at what's available through the community. Uh, in communities, they always have what they call health assessments. Um, and these are three to five year planning documents. Um, and they take into consideration uh, feeding, other poverty resources as well. Uh, the current one in the Roanoke area is the 2018 Korean Clinic Community Health Assessment, and that drives all their funding resources. Um, they've identified what the, what the um, critical areas are, and that drives who they fund. Uh, one of the things that I found very interesting was read the paper, look and see what's available, what other community groups are doing. Um, also, you can look at funding sources. Um, and um, I indicated here, try the ecumenical approach. 
uh, involve, in, inspire, um, and engage fellow organizations, other churches. Um, again, it's much easier uh, to do it as a group as opposed to doing it as a single organization. All right, Lene. Uh, once you've made the decision that this is a ministry or uh, activity that you want to pursue, look at creating community partnerships. Um, look at your local schools. Uh, is there a school adoption network? Uh, we do know that there are a lot of schools uh, that get community support. A lot of times there's really no networking among that, so you really don't know what school is being provided by what community group or organization. So look at some type of network. Obviously, churches, businesses, uh, again, it's important to note that the Virginia Senate and the ELCA have hunger grants available. Uh, and I thank John Wirtz and his work with the Senate in making uh, congregations aware of those opportunities. Look at colleges, technical schools. Uh, have conversations with your local school division uh, and local and state governmental leaders. Um, they're tremendous in providing resources and they're a good way to tap into potential funding sources as well. One of the things that we did uh, at our food pantries is we developed student councils. Uh, these members of the students uh, were, are responsible for the daily operation of the food pantries. Uh, and it gives them an opportunity to create the leadership, marketing, speaking and fundraising skills. Uh, they've actually gone into the community uh, with uh, fundraising opportunities and speaking opportunities. Uh, to help create an interest in their food pantries. Uh, special projects is always a good opportunity. Um, a food drive, local community fundraising, neighborhood activities uh, are all part of that as well. It's critical um, if you're gonna have a successful program that you have a good media and social media presence. Uh, it helps drive or create a buzz in the community. One of the issues that we first faced when we started, people were saying, you know, we don't have hunger issues in our community. And how many of us have heard that? Uh, but first of all, we documented it using our demographics. Uh, we documented by having several of our principals um, go on a speaking tour. Uh, there's nothing more emotional than having a teacher describe some of the situations with their students. Uh, we had we had people crying at some of our community groups. So tap into that local media, uh, create a website or some type of social media presence, uh, create a speakers bureau, have a marketing public relations team, developing marketing material. Uh, if you have the opportunity to do a newsletter um, for your volunteers, for other people within your community, um, I'm going to, one of the, um, advantages that I have is, is we, we uh, use constant contact. Um, and constant contact makes wonderful newsletters. Uh, and you can purchase contact, constant contact for less than $400 a year. Now that may be an expense, but I think it's certainly uh, the return on uh, this buzz in the community is certainly worth worth that expense. All right, Lene. Now, again, for you to have a successful um, ministry, you've got to have financial resources. Um, and you've got to be able to understand that people can say no, but you need to ask. Uh, you'll understand that the, the uh, community marketplace is very competitive, um, but there are local, regional, national grants and foundations. Uh, many churches um, and other faith-based groups have have um, funds available. You just need to be able to tap into that. Local government uh, has opportunities. Um, there, did, did you know that uh, the Commonwealth of Virginia had what they call Renew Virginia or Rebuild Virginia, I'm sorry, uh, which provided reimbursements uh, for organizations, for salaries, for rent, for expenses associated uh, with COVID-19. Um, you may be aware of the payroll protection program. Uh, if your organization has salaries, rent, and expenses, 
again, we just saw that the stimulus bill was just approved and there are billions of dollars that are gonna be granted to local and state governments. So be aware of those tremendous opportunities. Uh, Virginia Foundation for Healthy Youth uh, provides three year state obesity award grants. Uh, so take advantage of that. Um, so check with your local fundraising philanthropic organizations, Walmarts and Sam's clubs, they have community monies available, grocery chains, hospitals, uh, banks and other major local businesses often have community giving programs. So take advantage of what's available within your community. Uh, look at in-kind contributions. Uh, we've tapped into our vendors and our markets. Some of our fruit um, and produce vendors will provide dirty fruit, fruit that they can't sell, but uh, they're able to donate. Outlet stores for bread, pastries, and cookies. Uh, do you have community gardens now? Uh, can you tap in to get some of those uh, produce or vegetables from your local community garden? So again, there are a lot of opportunities uh, for you to continue to support uh, your feeding ministry programs. Um, so again, I hope you are able to use some of the uh, partnerships that we've talked about. Uh, but again, just understand that it is a commitment um, and it's not something that you want to be able to do for one year. So you need to be able to make sure that this is something that can be established on a long-term basis. Uh, you'd be surprised at the willingness of community organizations and groups and individuals to support, especially when you're talking about feeding children. Thank you. And again, there'll be an opportunity for questions at the end. Thank you, Gary. Sorry, I was on mute because I didn't want <laughs> to accidentally hiccup or something. Um, <laughs> so, and now we're going to turn to Monique and Monique is going to share uh, with us some of her experiences as director of bread for life food pantry. Thank you. All right. Um, is everybody hearing me? <clears throat> hearing me okay? Yes. All right. So um, we are the Bread for Life Community Food Pantry, and we're located in Gloucester, Virginia. Um, of course, oh goodness. and we have our mission, the Bread for Life is a community food pantry serving our brothers and sisters who are in need of food. And we serve with love and compassion to express the living word of Christ in our world today. And of course, Bread for Life is an equal opportunity provider. With our history, we, the uh, Bread for Life Community Food Pantry was first started by Father Jim Calls of St. Therese Catholic Church. We we're on the Catholic Church property and he saw a need for food assistance in Gloucester County. So we converted a two car garage and um, distributed food for the first time on March 19th, 2009, supplying bags of food to 13 families. And by our 10th anniversary in 2019, we were serving over 5,000 meals consisting of up to three tons of food each month to residents in Gloucester, Matthews, Saluda, and the surrounding area. Now we've seen due to COVID-19, our numbers have declined dramatically, but uh, we are starting to see an increase this year. So um, when the pantry was first established, the uh, uh, mentions a lot about communication. The entire board was consisting of pastors from local churches um, and that's what got helped get the word out uh, to all these families. So this was our building in 2014. We added an addition to make a grocery style setting, which is really a very unusual for this area um, that clients are able to pick the food that they want so they can choose what it is they're going to eat. And so at the Bread for Life, we say, who can shop here? Anyone, everyone is welcome at the pantry. 
We serve residents homeless. We've had travelers come through. And of course, all of these consist of active, retired military, seniors, adults, and children. And we allow them to shop once per week. And our grocery line provides canned goods, fresh vegetables, fruit, deli items, meat, dairy, bread, and desserts. Um, this is a big thing, um, like Gary had mentioned, our, we are an agency of the uh, Virginia Peninsula Food Bank, which provides us a lot of benefits, but you have to sign up for it. There are requirements that we must meet in order to be an agency with the food bank. So one of the programs is neighbor to neighbor. So all the local grocery stores save excess food for pantries to pick up. Our truck goes out five days a week to collect food. Um, and the ones, the four that support us in particular, Fresh Market Food Line, Aldi and Whole Foods, but other pantries go to Kroger, Walmart and other uh, grocery stores. Uh, TFAP is another program through the food bank uh, this is emergency assistance uh, program that's supplied by the U.S. Department of Agriculture. So um, it is a bag of canned and dry good foods, uh, at least two pounds of meat, and then uh, they usually will have an extra item like juice or cereal. And these items change monthly. There's a monthly shopping list. So who is eligible in the TFAP program? We meet, um, we are within a distribution region set by the food bank and you are to be a resident in that region. And then there are household income tables provided by the USDA with changes on a regular basis. So that helps our clients quite a bit. There's pretty much everyone is eligible for USDA that is a client with us. Additional services, there's CSFP. These are Commodity Services Food Program for senior citizens. They receive about a 30 pound box provided by the USDA one time per month. And anyone, uh, senior citizen age 60 and above, uh, and even if you have two seniors within a household, each senior can receive this box. And they have a um, maximum income requirement. Additional services, we also get um, turkeys each Thanksgiving at a wholesale price. And we've been distributing about 500 turkeys each year. Uh, the other thing, um, like Gary mentioned, extensive community support is so important. Uh, we have local farmers that will actually plant produce for us. And then we'll go out usually on the hottest day of the year and we go pick corn or black eyed peas and uh, some other products. Uh, community support also, we have local retailers that um, provide us with excess uh, inventory. Um, this is just, I don't expect anybody to read all this, but this is, these are our supporters in the community. Another huge source uh, in Gloucester County they have a food drive. All the county offices hold a food drive and they have a competition as to who can support, you know, provide the most uh, food, collect the most food. Uh, so it's like parks and recs and the sheriff's department and the um, uh, supervisor, the tax office. They all uh, participate in this and that is just a, a lot of fun. Um, but again, so many organizations, so many churches supply uh, food to us, run food drives, local businesses, Girl Scouts, um, all the schools hold food drives. We're about to go pick up a load uh, in a week. So this, this is important. The other thing that's really good, we have a, a very strong local uh, radio station. Uh, with a radio personality. So it's nice to uh, be able to talk to them and uh, get the word out um, to help people. 
and, and also let them know, you know, what are ours. And of course, we make all of this happen with our volunteers. Uh, we actually have 72 volunteers on our mailing list. So uh, it's a commitment. We're open three days a week. Uh, during COVID, we've only been open two days, but we need a lot of volunteers, truck drivers, uh, people to help process the food uh, during our hours. So anyway, we are open uh, two days a week right now. We hope shortly we'll be able to go back to three days. Um, but I thank you for allowing me to present about our much needed ministry here in this area. And I agree with Gary, this is a huge commitment to everybody. <laughs> well, thank you, Monique. Uh, we really appreciate you sharing your expertise with us. And now, um, Pastor Wirtz, if you would like to comment on Micah's initiatives. Sure. So um, I just dropped a bunch of links uh, in the chat. Uh, the Micah's link didn't go, but I'll, I'll add that one into just a few of the things I'm going to reference uh, as I'm talking here. Uh, as I said, I was a part of starting uh, something called Micah's Caring Initiative. It really started as Micah's Backpack. Um, so let me throw that up. Um, this is the website. Uh, uh, John Stromiello is the uh, director now for Micah's Backpack. I think he spoke at one of the earlier uh, ones of these. Um, but we had an opportunity to create a community-based uh, ministry uh, that worked with backpacks and became a mobile feeding piece and a garden. And uh, we did some clothing and then uh, fed some seniors. One of the opportunities I had while doing that was to be able to help a lot of backpack feeding programs get started. Gary mentioned coming up and talking to the folks in Salem, got to do that. Uh, but then we also uh, developed some resources on the website, uh, different things that could be tools to people uh, who are trying to get started to help them go. Because one of the things you realize when you get into hunger and feeding ministry is that it's a very local ministry. Um, there are opportunities we all have to learn from one another, uh, but feeding ministries really happen in the place you are. Uh, a group like uh, Feeding America uh, and all the different iterations of those around the state is a good connecting point. Uh, they're a great resource. Uh, and they can make the bigger national connections. But really when it comes to feeding folks who are hungry, uh, that's a local, very local effort uh, of bringing together partners. Uh, in doing that ministry, uh, we put together a list of uh, really six lessons from starting a backpack feeding program that I think actually work for any community-based ministry you wanna start. Uh, and the link to this document is in, in the chat. Um, and they're simply clearly define the goals you're trying to accomplish. Uh, it's hard to get people to join and be a part of something if you're not clear about what you're doing. Um, start small. Um, lots of folks look at a hunger issue or a problem and think, well, that's a lot of people to feed. Uh, that's a lot. And they want to try to solve the big problem. Um, it's much easier to start really small, learn what you're doing and scale as you have support uh, and you have uh, engagement from volunteers than it is to say, we have to feed 300 kids who are hungry. Nope, feed five of them and then figure out how to meet those continuing and growing needs when you start with five. Um, find good partners and trust them. Uh, no one congregation is going to be able to do all of this kind of uh, ministry by themselves. So whether it is uh, other congregations, other denominational groups, other faith groups, uh, community partners, find them and trust them. Um, provide help that's actually helpful. Um, sometimes we think we know what people need. Um, that's nice. Uh, ask. Uh, I think Gary said this too about talking to the community and really finding out what need is out there. Uh, as Monique referenced, um, uh, a client choice model where people get to select the food that they want um, is really sort of the gold standard of providing assistance to people as opposed to, uh, to simply saying, here's a bag of food. Now, sometimes like with backpack feeding programs, um, you know, the scale is such that you really have to do a set um, group of uh, food items. But even in that case, it's possible to get feedback and find out, hey, is what we're providing actually the food that kids want or that families need? Um, understand that excellent mistakes will happen. 
um, you're doing this and a, an excellent mistake is one you learn from. Um, you'll learn things, you'll try stuff, it'll work, it won't work. You learn from it uh, and you keep going. And then finally, the biggest one for me, perhaps on this whole list is say thank you. Um, there are a lot of people in the world who are willing to help, who would like to help, who want to make a difference. Uh, we've got to be really good at saying thank you uh, to let people know that we appreciate their willingness to be a part of this ministry uh, that we feel called to do and we're inviting them into. So there's those six. But then um, this year, as COVID came around, uh, we were doing some work uh, with what was then Lutheran Family Services of Virginia, what now goes by the name In Circle, uh, on a project for uh, Minnick Schools. Uh, and out of that project, We Are Church Together for the Sake of the World, is what we called it, um, sat down and, and just wrote out what I had learned through the years about identifying and creating community-based projects. Uh, I'm not going to go through this whole thing. The link is there. It's also on the Synod's website, uh, and I'm happy to send it to you. But it takes you step by step through listening and learning, uh, looking at opportunities and assets, designing a project, uh, inviting participation, saying thank you, delivering the assistance, telling the story, celebrating. Um, all of those pieces are there. Uh, if that's helpful to you, please take a look. Um, the last thing I want to uh, reference, oops, hold on, the little uh, chat thing is messing me up here. Um, let's see if it'll let me change. Hold on, got to stop sharing screen long enough to get it to let me change. I'll put the screen right back up. Um, the last thing I wanted to share was just something Gary mentioned about uh, data and statistics. Um, this is the, and I put it in the chat, this is the website for the Department of Education where you can find the data on free and reduced lunch. Uh, this part down here is where you can go by school. It's an Excel sheet. Uh, and so, is this the right one? Yeah. So for example, in um, Virginia Beach, I'm sitting in Norfolk this morning. Um, Virginia Beach is, these are all the different schools. And if you look over here, you can see the percentages that are free and reduced lunch for those schools. Um, that may give you some indication of what schools uh, have a particular level of need. Uh, if, you, if I scroll up, let me go to, uh, here's Roanoke City Schools. Um, there are exactly two schools in Roanoke City that are not 100% eligible for free and reduced lunch. Um, this matters, this data matters uh, as you relate to different programs. Um, particularly governmental programs uh, like the summer feeding program, which has been expanded and extended some for this coming summer. Um, a lot of times you've got to be over a certain percentage uh, to be able to tap those programs for us, for the area you're trying to serve. So this is just really handy data to have access to. And again, I dropped that link um, in the chat. Uh, there are all kinds of ways that we can walk with folks uh, and accompany and, and serve people uh, who are uh, hungry and in need. Um, the best way I've found though, is by being in partnership, being in partnership with other folks in the community, being in partnership with the folks uh, who are in need to really have a sense of, you know, what's the help we can deliver that's helpful and how, we can, how can we do it in a way uh, that makes the biggest impact. So I'm going to stop there and just uh, turn it back over uh, to Sandy and see what kind of questions we might have. Thank you, John. Um, <clears throat> well, we do have a question that came in before we actually started, and this was from uh, St. Luke's, and they were they indicated that they're struggling with a good way to capture information about in-kind donations. Um, wanting to know what are some of the things that you all do to capture that information. Any, I'm going to let e any of you that want to talk about that, feel free. Well, first of all, you've got to be aware of it. Uh, so there needs to be some type of mechanism uh, or process or procedure uh, to catalog them. Uh, and what we do is, I mean, we do a simple Excel spreadsheet. Um, 
when we were, we're made aware of that. Now we have a couple points of contact, for example, at the closed closet in our feeding programs. Uh, we just simply ask that whoever's received it, um, just make sure they log it. And then obviously we would recognize uh, the donor of, of that. We would still recognize the in-kind contribution as well. But the real issue is, is, is knowing that you received it. Uh, um, a lot of times we have, and I'm sure some of the others do, is just have an outside box where people can donate items or clothing or whatever. And obviously we wouldn't know who does that unless they provide that information. That's really true. Uh, I work with the Blacksburg Interfaith Food Pantry and we too have a box outside as well as people will just walk up with a right. small bag of food and, and depending on who's volunteering that day, they may not consider that worthy of logging. So that becomes, we're struggling to capture that as well. Uh, Monique, do you have any, um, any thoughts on that? Yeah, <clears throat> what we do is all donations, all of our food donations are weighed in. We have a scale, we have food categories um, because again, it all has to do with our monthly reporting to the food bank and we find it is the easiest way to do. And I agree, many times people donate food uh, every week and they just say to put it down as anonymous. We also have receipts. So if somebody wants to uh, be listed as a regular donor, then um, we will fill out a form for them and, and keep a copy. And that way we have them on our records. Absolutely. <clears throat> yeah, it is. Uh, I know where I am, we, um, we do weigh donations and we have a multiplier of the weight times a uh, dollar and 73 cents. This is because we partner with Feeding America. And so that gives us a monetary value. Um, I don't know if you guys do something similar. Um, we also have a combination of direct donations. People will drop off checks and cash and things. And then that gets deposited, but we also have a website and uh, that goes through our, we work with it's an organization called New River Community Action. That is where we get our 5013C, uh, C3, sorry, uh, designation. Um, but let me open this up to others because I know we have um, other people attending. Does it, do other people have questions that they would like to ask our panel and sort of pick their brain here? Andy, I'd like to follow up with, you just talked about the 501C3. And I think it's very important if you're going to have a long-term community ministry that you get your 501c3. This is a nonprofit status. Um, many foundations and other grant organizations will not even process an application unless you have a 501c3. Uh, so I would encourage you to get that. Uh, and again, I think it provides some legitimacy uh, when you're asking for dollars. Uh, because you have now um, gone through that step. And it, it's, uh, I mean, it's quite a lengthy process to get the 501c3, but I think it's certainly worth the effort because, again, it does open up a lot of doors for you that may not be open uh, without that certification. And I just uh, jump on that to say, too, that um, in a lot of cases, um, you can start. Uh, using the 501c3 status of the congregation. Uh, if you're going to establish, if you're going to build something that is uh, far larger uh, or for which the, maybe moves beyond where the congregation is, or if you're really going after grants um, that are corporate based, um, then moving the step to get your own independent 501c3 from the congregation certainly makes sense, as Gary was describing. Um, but you can start it as a congregational ministry and build out uh, uh, from there, if, if you don't want to try to, <laughs> if you want to see where it goes, uh, and, and let that develop. Um, the other thought just to add, uh, to the question about in-kind donations, um, one of the ways that I think you can get information on in-kind donations is just teach people who might be receiving those in-kind donations, um, to ask the right question. Uh, and in our case, the question was, um, 
Thank you so much for this. We'd love to send a thank you note to you or to your organization. Will you give us your name and an email address? And so we taught all the people who would be in the building when donations got dropped off, even people who were just a part of the congregation's ministry, to ask that question. Uh, and that really upped uh, the, the amount of information we were able to capture uh, on in-kind donations. Anybody else? Questions? Hi, I was wondering if I could ask a question. I am um, Margaret Nemo Holland with Encircle, formerly Lutheran Family Services, and happy to be on this call. Um, I first want to say thank you because I know that uh, our students have been the beneficiaries of backpack programs and many of the feeding ministries of the Synod churches. So we are very grateful for that. Um, I just wanted to lift up another potential growing need and, and seek advice on how we might meet that. Um, we have out of our Richmond office, uh, what has been a very small, but is now growing rapidly immigration and refugee program. So we uh, assist the families who are receiving um, unaccompanied minors who come to this country. And so what we have been doing is some of the background checks um, just a very small slice of that whole process that is extremely complicated, as you can imagine. Um, we have now expanded and are doing um, case management for those kids once they are placed with either their extended family in this country or sponsor families. And uh, we knew that uh, with the change in administration that probably um, this would expand, but I have to tell you, we've been sort of amazed at how rapidly it has changed. And I'm sure you're all reading the news about the number of people sort of flooding the, the border. So we know it will increase. So this is an anticipatory question of now that we have, we will be having a little bit more contact with these families and able to follow them. Whereas before we really had one appointment. So it was a specific point in time and that was it. Our staff is gonna have much more opportunity to learn what the other needs of these kids and their sponsor families are. Um, so when we think about hunger, which is likely to be one of them, I'm wondering if it makes sense for those of you who have done something like a pantry, does it make sense for us to try and do that on our own? Or are we replicating something that already exists and we'd be better tapping into what already exists in the community? I think you're, you're, you're we're back to the it's worth knowing what everybody's doing in your area. Um, I could certainly imagine uh, creating a, um, a food program that accompanies those kids. It allows you to tap into resources um, and funnel them directly through uh, to that group. Um, but if they're, if, if they're connected, let's just say they're connected to a school, then there's a fairly reasonable chance that that school may already have the partnership that provides the feeding piece. And so then it's, you know, it's, it's uh, extra effort for you to create something instead of tapping into what they've already got. Um, by the same token, I could see if, if these are really young kids, if these are folks who might be getting placed in, in spots where um, services are going to be hard to get to, um, then, uh, yeah, then you could, yeah, then you could pretty easily, I think, launch a, uh, a feeding piece that then draws on partners to say, this is a group of people we're trying to feed, we're going to have food that's available to them, can you help us provide resources, whether that's tapping into a Feeding America, or that's tapping into a network of churches around uh, who have a passion for it. But yeah, I'd start with, are you connected to schools? If you are, that's the best starting point in most cases. Okay, that's super helpful. And I think that the kids are gonna be placed all over Virginia. Right. I think we are one of the only sites. And so um, that'll be something as we get a little more experience under our belts, we'll figure out. So thank you. Sure. And I was just gonna say, if you, if you know of the feeding opportunities in the area, like John is building on, I know our experience here in Blacksburg when we had some Syrian uh, refugees right before everything got shut down by the Trump administration, um, we made sure to work 
I'm with the Blacksburg Food Pantry, but the, um, we worked with the refugee resettlement group and they brought them over and we had them tour the pantry and we got them read, you know, registered and so that they knew and got familiar with what we had to offer as well. So sometimes it's a bit of research that, but I think you'll find that there are food groups that are more than willing to help. Wonderful, thank you. Mm -hmm. Also, area. if you're in the Richmond area, I recommend contacting the food banks. They have very strong, uh, well, established food banks up there that can help you as well. They can even help you with um, shopping. You know, they usually shopping set up, uh, area set up for uh, local organizations. So that's also a good source. Yes, Feedmore is an excellent, excellent resource in our community. Thanks. Anyone else? Do we have more questions? I am looking at the chat. I don't see any. Anybody else? Just want to make sure we're covered here. OK. Well, first of all, let me thank our three speakers today. I think you shared a lot of information. Um, and would you be willing to, well, we've got the links from John, they're in the chat. So if you click on those links real quick, they'll come up and then you can download that information if you, if you need to. I guess we could send out an email with those links as well. Can we not, Lene? Um, yes, yeah, we'll send up a follow-up email tomorrow and I'll include the links on there. We also have um, a list that we have started of resources in a folder. And so one is if you fill out this contact information that I just put in the chat, um, that will give me permission to add your, your name and contact into our folder of resources. And um, that is public for anybody that goes to that folder and can start to network and share ideas and things too. And then I'm gonna share a link for our resource folder and the information from today will get added into that folder too. And Gary, can we share your PowerPoint as well? Sorry, you're muted. <laughs> I'm sorry, I was filling out the form. Uh, you, <laughs> certainly, you certainly may. <laughs> okay. So, Lene, since you have it, could you just attach it to um, that email? That'd be great. Yes. Uh, anybody else? I'll do a final call for questions or anything. If not, hey, Sandy, um, I, I thought, yes. Oh, sorry, it's John. I thought of one more no. thing I, I meant to share that, um, that I think is helpful. Um, if you were applying for grants from local groups like a grocery store or uh, I wouldn't even bother to try Walmart most times because everybody asks Walmart. But if you are, um, you tend to have better success with companies if you have somebody from that company who volunteers with you or who supports you. Uh, and so, you know, if you if uh, if you're trying to reach out the food line, mm -hmm. find the food line employee who wants to work with you and then then apply and you'll have better luck because uh, there are a lot of a lot of groups that are willing to give uh, a lot of companies that have money to give and the way you find them usually is by the employees not by just looking on their website for grant opportunities that's a very good point john um that's been some success for us as well to be able to reach out to a company that way and just to be aware that that these things exist in your community and i, I want to emphasize again don't be afraid to ask uh, all they can say is no, or they have no monies available. Uh, but again, you'd be surprised at what resources are available if you simply ask. And, and it's still a no. If you don't ask, it's a no. But if you Absolutely. ask, it may be a yes. So Absolutely. <laughs> you've increased yourself at least by 50% by, by just asking. So, well, thank you everyone for uh, coming today. We really appreciate your input. Um, I would encourage you to sign up for the rest of our series. We have two more sessions. We're gonna have someone 
uh, at our next session in April with uh, from Feeding America to uh, share what they do with us. So we'll hope to see you next month. Go out and enjoy the sunshine <laughs> that we're experiencing this week. It's lovely. Thank you again. Sandy, Sandy let me men just give a heads up for, for this group. Um, the next meeting is uh, the second Thursday of April. So that's April 8th um, at noon. Um, in May, it's being, we've had to shift it to the first Thursday in May, May 6th, because of a conflict in our, in the Senate office. So we've got April 8th and May 6th. Um, and as Sandy said, next month, we've got uh, the director of children's feeding programs um, at Feeding America Southwest Virginia, who will be joining the conversation. So um, John, you look like you also were holding up your hand like you were going to you want to know? Okay. Um, so yeah, thank you. We, we look forward to being able to share those resources that from today and that resource folder also has resources linked in it from the previous gatherings that we've had and conversations that we've had. Thank you all for your feeding ministries, for your passion for God's people who are hungry, um, for your uh, care and compassion um, that, you're, that you exhibit. And thank you Monique and uh, Gary and John for sharing your expertise and insights today. Thank you very much. Goodbye. All right. Bye, y'all. Thank all. you. <clears throat>